Welcome to Diverse and Converse. This month, we are celebrating Black Heritage Month. Specifically, we are celebrating Black women artists who have shaped and really became a vital role in shaping this month through the rich, richness of art, music, and history, slash her story. Our community producer and my co-host Queen will be serving as a panelist this month. Welcome Queen. Hey Leah, how are you doing? I'm well, I'm well. Happy Black Heritage Month to you. To you. Thank you, I'm so excited to be here. Some awesome panelists today. And I'm just really excited to celebrate what is Black Heritage Month and as you said, history. Yeah. Um, I will start <laughs> off by giving honor to the land that we're on. This land is so full of rich indigenous history and truly a home to the First Nation and Métis, but a home to me and a home to our community that was so welcomed and so you know, lovingly brought into these lands by our indigenous brothers and sisters. And during Black Heritage Month, it's a really great time to offer the land that is sacred, that is safe, and that is really truly for everyone thanks to our Indigenous brothers and sisters. And today we are forever grateful for them and the opportunities we are brought. And I'm so excited to have these two beautiful, amazing, I, I could just go on and on about these excellent women that we have on today. We have Aisha Barrow, who is an up and coming Let's just be real. She is just a pure artist, singer songwriter based out of Guelph and Hamilton. She has a bold, new, fresh sound that draws inspiration from her roots. She was born in Saudi Arabia, yet culturally from the Republic of Gambia. She continues to use her rich musical history to influence her unique sound. This sound can be best described as a mixture of pop, R&B, but Aisha Barrow is currently in the process of recording her debut album, an R&B pop-based project, Life in the Tribe. And we're so excited to talk about that as well today. So Aisha, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And of course, the beautiful and wonderful Varese. It's just an honor to have you here today. You're a beautiful singer, songwriter, and recording artist based out of this uh, beautiful city of Guelph. You're a Canadian gospel artist, which is just so empowering. I know I listen to your music every Sunday morning and <laughs> real throughout the week. And you've worked on so many projects that combine traditional and contemporary and mm. neo-soul and even spoken word. I'm just so honored to be talking about some of the work that you've done and some of the people that you've worked mm. with and some of the experiences you've had in this industry and in this space. Not only are you a musician, but you are a mother of three beautiful children and you've worked in this financial industry for 11 years so you're just a full well-rounded mama bear <laughs> thrilled to have you on today so thank you you know what it's 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 an honor to be here thank you for this amazing opportunity uh, i look forward to our dialogue this afternoon yeah it's going to be quite amazing yeah. we have a panel of black excellence so let's get started queen we're going to start off with you now, you know, let's do a little bit of history before we dive into some history before we go into anything else, because we have to honor this month and the significance of this month. Now, of course, across a lot of media platforms, we know this month as Black History Month. However, Black Heritage Month seems to be the correct way to pay tribute to the Black people in our country. Queen, let's talk about the language here and what the difference is between Black Heritage Month and Black History Month. Absolutely. You know, this is really just a change that we are trying to enforce around the Guelph area. I wish I could take credit for it, but uh, the credit goes to the wonderful president of Guelph Black Heritage Society, Denise Francis. And really the idea behind this was that so often this narrative around enslaved people is the conversation that happens at Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And while we really, truly, thankfully, and honor our ancestors, we also want to take a look at what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. There are beautiful, wonderful things that are happening in our present, and that means that we're working towards a different future. And I think for Black Heritage, that really encompasses all that is past, present, and future. So that name mm -hmm. change is something we're really just trying to push throughout all of Guelph, all of Kitchener, all of Waterloo, and hopefully all the way up to Ottawa, because mm -hmm. I think this really need to concentrate on is getting away from that enslaved narrative and looking towards 
all that encompasses the beauty of being black. Mm -hmm. So beautiful and it's such a beautiful rich story and you know it's 25 years ago this month that Canada officially named this month Black History Month. So how can we get kind of this name being changed to Black Heritage Month across the board, Queen? What would be the next steps for us? I mean, we're really lucky here in Guelph. We have some amazing elected officials like Mike and Lloyd. And I think we're really lucky to have someone like Lloyd Longfield who works so heavily and deeply in trying to raise voices in his own community. Um, and that is the thing, the next tool that we need, right? We need that legislation. We need to make that change. Hopefully someone like Anna Marie Paul will be, you know, rooting for these changes to happen. And because we're in such monumental times, people want to see these actively changed, right? And it, I think it takes the petitions. Hopefully once I have some free time in my hands, <laughs> all that free time, we can get working on getting that started so that we can make that change and make that effort tangible and actionable. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And only with change can things really change, right? And that's the important thing. So let's talk about Black art, more specifically the narrative of Black art. Mm -hmm. Now, Varese and Aisha, you both are beautiful artists. Now, do you feel a responsibility for your work to deconstruct the narrative of you know, Black art? I, I'll let Reese go first and then I will. Um, absolutely. Um, if you think of, of the kind of art or art form that we express, it's probably the easiest way for me to communicate with anybody of any ethnicity versus being limited to just people who look like me or sound like me or sing the same genre of music that I do. And the way we express in that art form can get somebody to connect and from that interconnection, then there's dialogue. Mm. And so that for me is then, you know, I think most revealing about the art form of, of just interconnectedness. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree with, um, with Reese with that. Um, the, the quality of the voice is, is such a great medium to, mm -hmm. to, to, I mean, essentially it's how we how we communicate with one another right so um uh, why wouldn't that be true for communicating with masses as well and expressing mm -hmm. and expressing what back blackness feels like to me what blackness feels like to reese what, what what blackness feels like in general i mean we know our stories aren't monolithic but um any any sort of uh any sort of viewership that we can give these stories kind mm -hmm. of kind of allows us to to share experiences, however large or however little they may be to one another and to kind of break down those barriers. Speaking of Black Heritage Month off the top, you know, it can feel a little bit performative sometimes, you know, especially when it comes to the media, they kind of thrive off of the Black trauma and the Black pain. And we've seen mm -hmm. that time and time again, and maybe even using this month as that kind of situation. However, how can we continue to celebrate all year round versus just one day or one month like it's not enough it's not enough we need to do more so how can we do that yeah i mean it's just simple <laughs> like it's so simple like i feel like it's like asking a kid what one plus one is and it is that simple it's just doing it right mm -hmm. the thing is, is i think we're really seeing people trying to engage in taking this concept of black history into heritage and bringing it throughout the year whether that be through education and curriculum through you know, the new project that Lorraine Harris has launched in this area, my place in this world, whether it's through the Black Brilliance program, whether it's through all these different facets, whether it's through the stories we tell through our artistic narratives leading in to the year, right? Like if you look at this panel, we're Black today, we're Black tomorrow, we're Black in March, <laughs> April, May, June, July, right? Mm -hmm. All of that transcends for us every single day. So it can do the exact same thing for everybody else. And I think it's just taking, I, I think now it's actually taking diligent work to go ahead and start making sure that that's part of your regular life. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily have to be performative. And I think that that's by taking risks without unearned benefits, knowing that anything that you do, whether it be performative, right? Like some, someone out there isn't always gonna be happy about what you do, mm. but, the majority in the masses, if you're staying genuine, you're staying authentic, you're trying to stay educated and you're trying to use that education 
not just in February, but spread that diversity throughout the year, people are going to really try to understand and see that that, is, that change is happening not only from us, but from our allies as well. And I think, you know, for us, Black heritage is all year round. It's in everything that we do. It's in like mm -hmm. the movements that we make, the sounds that we do, the mm -hmm. hair that you see. And that's things that we're really, really proud of. Those things that, you know, for so long, white supremacy has pushed away or pushed down and not wanted to tell those stories. So now it's time to take our place in every month, in every space. We can have these conversations. We, we don't have to wait until a date in February to make the conversation happen. Mm -hmm. And that's for our community as well, right? We don't have to wait for February to come along to have a mental health chat. But let's get on a conversation early mm -hmm. and let's do it once a month for the sake of our community. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, like being a woman of color sitting on the panelist with the panel with beautiful black women, this is a moment of unity. This is where allyship comes in. This is where the learning, the unlearning, the stuff that we thought we knew, this, you know, this is where we get the chance to use our voices and speak to empowering women like Faris and Aisha and Queen and learn and not wait for February to come around every month just to you know get some information. It's got to be all year round and it's got to be passed down to our children. And Baris, you have children as well. How have mm -hmm. you been able to kind of navigate this time with them? Um, it's, it's such an interesting dynamic. Um, I, I try to first but before February rolls around to empower them in who they are. Mm -hmm. So before they leave the house, they know you are beautiful. You, you are just fine as they come. And so I reinforce the fact that they don't need affirmation outside of this house and mean that they don't get it. And if they don't get it, they don't feel less than anybody else. Society has dictated uh, what beauty is. And so if I don't reinforce that and correct that in my house, then my children would always feel deflated outside of the house because, you know, thankfully gone are the days that they were told they were ugly on the school bus, you know? And so letting them know that you're beautiful from inside. So sometimes it gets a little conceited because now my, my youngest will tell me, you know, when I say, baby, you're beautiful. And she goes, I know, mom. <laughs> tells me that. that she believes it she knows it. so it, in she doesn't have to feel awkward about who she is and in, in her skin mm -hmm. you know, she's compelled now to live and be bold being in her skin and that makes me as a mama mm, very very happy absolutely using that opposition for opportunity you know it's almost like you need a bit of that negativity to really see who you are on the inside and I mean, it's great to have all the positive affirmations, but we need some of the negativity to really like dive deep sometimes inside and really build the strength that we need. And I mean, it's not enough to survive it all because we do want to thrive, but just hearing how your babies are just so confident in just saying, I am beautiful mama. Like that is just, you just know you're doing a good job as a mom right there. So we commend you for that. And that is just so beautiful. Thank you. Oh. It's it's work, you know. Yeah. It's it's work, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and sure. and if you think about it, it it's probably sad but true. It shouldn't be work. It should have mm. just been natural. Yeah. Why yeah. was there a need for this overemphasis mm -hmm. of saying mm -hmm. that you're beautiful just because yeah. the highly likely that somebody's going to tell you the opposite? Yeah. You know, wow. so I, my, my prayer is always that they live in a world. I've, I've been saying this, I think it's been my mantra since, since the year started or since really last April or May when the whole, when the world shifted. Mm -hmm. That and world that reckoning that we probably live in a world. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. To live in a world where we can thrive together. Mm -hmm. You know, the shade yeah. of brown shouldn't make anybody feel inferior or that, you know, I'm coming to attack you or, or I don't speak eloquently or to speak eloquently means I'm putting on or you know all of these negative stereotypes it's time for us to just literally um, do an inward look and decide okay like my song enough is enough okay enough like we we've we've been there done that we've gotten nowhere with it maybe let's start looking at things you know with an open perspective of okay things We've tried it for how many years this way and Absolutely. it's not working. 
let's just see, because queen is queen every day, beautiful yeah. inside out without a narrative. Once you've added a narrative, you think she is without knowing who she is. We're back at square one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The work is so important, Reese. The work that you're in, what you were instilling in your children is so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen a shift uh, and I, in the way that kids younger than me are, are expressing themselves, black, black children, mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. girls are expressing themselves and expressing their beauty and, and accepting their beauty. And it comes from sort of this knowing from your generation and my generation that something needed to change and that needed to happen with us. You know, we've been, um, we've been sort of calling out to the powers that be to make these changes for us. And time and time again, it's been proven that that um, they're not going to give us any power that we don't take. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's entirely up to us to <laughs> sort of grab it by the by the foothold. So it, it's so important to to validate um, to validate the children to to instill in them these 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 thoughts and these beliefs that that help them succeed. Uh, I mean. Some of these kids are freedom fighters. The way that they talk online, the way that they, you know, that they like protect and, and attack. I think that's what they say. Um, uh, but they're so strong-willed and so amazing to see because I, at 12, could never say I was beautiful. But I know that my little sister was saying it at 12, at 13, 14, 15, 16, and she carries that with her. And that's amazing to see. That's amazing to see. Now we know collaboration is very key and art, music and self-expression connects us all that way. And it's really important. And Aisha, you have been using your musical expressions from a very early age. Can you talk to us about that and how you kind of got into music? Well, how did I got it, get into music? Uh, I fell into it. I, I always say that this is not something that I would have chosen. It chose me. <laughs> um, you know, I come from an African household. There is no being a musician. It doesn't exist. You either become a lawyer, an engineer, or a doctor, um, or a failure, but that's a little harsh. <laughs> one end or the other <laughs> <laughs> that's a little harsh no um uh but i was i've been singing my entire life um and it, it was just it was like anything you would do it's kind of like breathing it wasn't something that i actively knew that i could do it was just i'd walk down the hall and i'd be singing i'd go to bed and i'd be singing and that somehow morphed into um me trying to learn how to play instruments and then um, me really listening to what my sisters would listen to, my older sisters would listen to and their taste in music and picking up on sort of the vocal qualities and the vocal tones that I really enjoyed um, and incorporating that into my own, my own music. Um, and if representation in this, in this aspect really, really does matter because I have a very deep vocal tone when I'm singing and a lot of the pop stars that I was listening to didn't have that, but I, it was then that I turned to black woman who had like deep guttural tones, you know, um, Anita Baker, uh, 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 Tony Braxton, um, uh, Nina Simone. Those are the women that really uh, solidified music for me and and that's how I saw it and thought that maybe I could pursue something like this and from then on it was just kind of like lightning I just kept going for it and I've been enjoying it <laughs> it seems like it's been an incredible a journey because you've been able to build collaboration with mm -hmm. life and the tribe mm -hmm. talk to us about this evolution with the group well Everything about music is collaborative. There's no, there's no way that you can do it on your own, um, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, so, so much uh, so the lead vocalist gets, you know, the shine. But I work with amazing drummers and 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 bassists and keyboardists and 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 all around the musical, you know, wheel of life um, and that's the essence of what life in the tribe is it's this idea that that i'm bringing all these musicians together to create a product that um that really speaks to us and specifically in my case speaks to dark-skinned black women you know i want to tell the stories that that we have um to show our multifacetedness uh you know so so much so we are relegated to to just one thing and and 
it just it never sat well with me never felt right with me and and a lot of my music is about showing our stories when we're sad when we're happy when we're when we're in peace when we're feeling joyful and I find that the best way to do that is to collaborate with as many musicians as I can and as many black women as I can because again we're not a mon monolith we all have different stories to tell and that's what my music is about essentially yeah mm -hmm. uh, it really is and you know your singing and your songwriting has really amplified others to use their voices as well mm -hmm. how have you been able to do that well, it's just, it's a matter of saying the story and allowing a space for other people to tell their stories as well. Mm -hmm. That's, it's really that simple. It's about yeah. giving space for people to tell their stories as well. And the best way you do that is to say your own story unabashedly. Um, my new song that I just put out is called Type. And that that is a direct result of being inundated with messaging about dark-skinned black men and our unworthiness and our and our and our supposed unattractiveness etc and i knew that i didn't feel that way i knew that i was deserving i knew that i felt attractive i mean i look at myself in the mirror and i'm like hey i think you're cute um, <laughs> um yes, <girl. laughs> yeah and i knew and i knew that this messaging was just wrong because it just didn't sit right in my spirit um it didn't make any sense to me I didn't think that I was less deserving. So I felt the need to say that story in that song. It's a braggadocio, it's kind of braggadocious. Um, it, it's, a, it's definitely out of my comfort zone. It's a hip hop type of tune, but that's the energy that I wanted for it, to show confidence in, in, my, in my hue and my skin tone and to give space for other women who look like me to feel that confidence and to, to say, this isn't right. I know that I am deserving. I know that I'm cute to boot, so. <laughs> own it, you no, have exactly. to own it, right? Why you acting like I ain't your type? Don't you dare believe in all the hype. You know, baby, I could keep it right for you. Keep it tight for you, never lie to you. So why you acting like I ain't your type? It ain't no secret. Now let's talk about your new music video that you have coming out and the beautiful visuals that you have going on in the video. <laughs> yeah, um, that one was an interesting one to do because it was way too freezing and the dress was entirely too short. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but you made it work. <laughs> made, it, made it work. Um, yeah, it's just, it was another way for me to celebrate my cue. I think um, the messaging gets in our head a lot about, about whether we are uh, specifically in terms of attractiveness, whether we are attractive or not. And then that um, kind of beats down on our confidence and doesn't maybe necessarily allow us to dress the way we want to or to present ourselves in the way that we want to. And the music video in particular is a celebration of how I feel about myself. So I, you know, I just wanted to feel present the way that I felt inside. And so it's a, it's just visuals of me out in nature where I feel the most comfortable, um, really celebrating the way that I look and, you know, the way that I feel about myself. So I hope it resonates. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I just love the confidence that you're oozing you. from it. And it will read very well across the screen to many young girls who are going to be watching this feeling that empowerment and it's truly truly inspiring okay. now just before we go to break we know that things have looked quite different this year due to the pandemic but we also want to make sure that we are still honoring black heritage month and that means you know there are still plenty of ways to celebrate so queen can you talk to us about some of the ways that we continue to celebrate safely from our homes I mean, it's all virtual, isn't it, this year? Everything we do is virtual. And I think we're learning a new way of how to make that a new norm. But what we're really trying to highlight through this is using that creativity to make really empowering, impactful events. You know, people like um, uh, Laura Mae Lindo, who we had out that, for me, it was a game changer. Seeing an MPP with like, reds singing to her ancestors mid conversation like everything about that i was like <laughs> if this is what the new canadian politics can look like then i'm here for it so that was really impactful and you know having people like salem debs coming up of course we actually have aisha coming up on the fourth friday with wealth museum and i think you know what was really most important this black heritage month was making black space 
Mm-hmm. Now, you know, it can be hard for some people to really understand what that means, but it's about having a space where we can feel safe, where we can feel connected, where we don't have to explain anything, where we don't have to, you know, go through all that is that we're dealing with. So we do have a black mental health event coming up next week that is, you know, specifically gauged to that. And I love that because it is so difficult. Like Aisha, you said about amplifying black women voices and the the work that they do behind the scenes on your, um, you know, while you are in the forefront of this shining star that I love seeing. I've gotten to see the growth of Aisha grow up because I've had that pleasure of knowing her for so long and it's been spectacular to watch that journey. Um, and, and then like uh, doing an improv session, and you know, there's just all sorts of things that you can get involved in lots of organizations from BLM groups to, you know, the CCWAR from the OBHS. There's all these wonderful ways of getting connected, you know, and of course my favorite thing on Sunday is gospel Sundays that always <laughs> Marisa's gotten a few videos from me, like rocking on my nights and her music. <laughs> Like I get so into these things and maybe that, that piece is that connection again, right? And Black Heritage Month is all about creating not only the history, but allowing education, but also allowing a space for representation to be acknowledged and to be celebrated for, you know, not only Black women, but for our Black males and our, you know, Black queer groups, our LGBTQIA plus groups. We have so much to celebrate because Black is so beautiful. And this month, it's just an honor to be able to speak with such brilliant women about this. Beautiful, just so beautiful. And we're going to head into a break right now. But after the break, we will talk about community building through artivism, how to support local Black artists, and more. So stay tuned for more after the break. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. I'm Star. Short for Starbra. Assume yours is Barbara. Nope, just Barb. I want to thank Barb and Star for hosting tonight's Talking Club and for making their hot dog soup. I like the salt. I like the hot dog. It's not as runny as it usually is. Look, my new phone case. <laughs> I love it! It's like I'm listening to the ocean. Wait, we don't have cell phones. I know I'm going to take it home and glue it to our landline. Oh. They served to protect our homes. Now many are homeless. They fought for our way of life. Now many are fighting personal battles of their own. They answered the call for our country. Now we honor them by serving our communities. Help us help Canada's veterans. Become a Legion member today. Learn how to create your own masterpiece while in the comfort of your own home. On the Canvas with Lisa Braun is a step-by-step art lesson. On the Canvas, Mondays at 5.30 p.m. on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Diverse and Converse. If you're just joining us, we are honoring Black Heritage Month and the enormous contribution that has been given by the Black women artists through beautiful music, self-expression, and art. Now, right before the break, we spoke about different ways how we can celebrate virtually. I'm curious for Aisha and Reese, how are you going to be celebrating Black Heritage Month? Well, I'm just going to be celebrating by really inundating myself with the people and the Black artists that I love. This is, Black artists have contributed so much to our lexicon of pop, uh, music, dance music, whatever music you're thinking of, you know? Um, So I think a lot of my celebration is going to be just taking time for solitude. The world has been kind of crazy and Black people have been inundated with so much trauma that I think, you know, this is the time for us to really, really just take in our power and and rebuild our strength. 
you know, we do so much of the work. It's a time for, you know, people of other cultures and races to truly do the work. But I think it's a time for us to rest. <laughs> if I'm totally honest with you, I think we deserve it. I think, I think we, we should take time to explore and enjoy our art and rest. And that's how I will be celebrating it. I'm completely honest with you. <laughs> you deserve the rest. Yeah. So you take that rest. <laughs> how about you, Reese? How will you be celebrating? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the things that I've been doing with my family on the weekends is we try to just get out of the house, especially because we've gone back into lockdown. Mm -hmm. We go for a drive and we just talk and we put on any kind of music, we start singing. And then I found out that there was a Bob Marley celebration the other day. And I, well, my children might feel like I was forcing them, but I'm like, no, come check this out. And so they were showing, you know, different artists and stuff. And we just sat there and I was totally enjoying the moment of just looking at things culturally. Mm -hmm. And my youngest just started dancing. I won't post her videos, but I'm just dancing and going, yes, you know, this is your heritage. This is, yeah, this is you. She was loving it. And for me, that was like, wow. Not only is she learning things all Canadian because that's her heritage mm -hmm. now but it transcends beyond that you know learn about mama's heritage what it means to grow up in jamaica and hear this music and and see the drummers and see you know the different instruments being played and and see the little children in school uniforms singing mm -hmm. it was such a like a moment for me of just learning that with my children things that i probably took for granted growing up because it's just there and it was just beautiful to see I think the other part of that is also to participate in things like this, you know, engaging with different artists, different genres about learning their, their, their nature in terms of Afrocentric uh, music, because, you know, I'm, I'm considered a gospel Christian contemporary artist, uh, but there are many other different genres that could also learn from what I bring to the table and also for me to learn for what they're bringing to the table as well. And, and I think it's, it's now a, a great opportunity for us to literally learn from each other because again, we're passing on to the next generation. So Varese is here now, but Varese is not going to be always be the artist on Diverse and Converse. And so the other artists are coming up after us. What are we showcasing and teaching them, you know, about what we do? You know what I mean? For what Queen is bringing to the table. What are we going to do for the next? So I'm always thinking next generation because it's like, yeah, had Miss Jean Augusta not, you know, fight to have Black history on the books, you know, we wouldn't be dialoguing this way. So I think next gen, because again, she didn't realize 25 years ago, we'd be having this conversation today, but those seeds were planted. And so now that those seeds have taken root and become trees, what are we gonna do for the next gen? So it's important for us to continue the conversation, not just this month, exactly. but every month. And so I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm really happy that Queen had mentioned about what MPP Laura May Lindo is doing. In other words, let's let's just make some shift. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like you're making noise, but outside of those noise, we have changes and impactful changes. And I'm here to celebrate that. Yes, the unity of one love, right? This is what it's all about. And speaking of transcending music, Reese, you have transcended music through your gospel music. It's uplifted so many people, especially through so much Black trauma and pain. And, you know, you have powerful new music that's out. We just want to know, like, how have you been able to sing and come up, you know, with all this beautiful words that you come like I was listening to your music this morning by the way I just have to say and I literally just felt so emotional like it, it just brings something out of you and I know when our audience listens to your new music out there you know they're gonna feel the same thing too so how have you been able to use your music to address social justice issues that was significant, you know, I mean, all this time I've been writing, um, they were very faith based and this one is considered for me faith based it's just I think I shared uh, with somebody else I said this is faith just being woke. Mm. Yeah. And I remembered when I was writing that song in particular, I was really ticked what was happening in the world. And as a mother of three children, as you alluded to earlier, I happen to have a male black child. And it, 
I'm grateful in Guelph. I don't have to worry if he leaves and he goes downtown. But if I'm my sister's keeper, my sisters all across North America are wondering, what if he goes downtown? What if he goes down by Jane and Finch? What if he goes down, you know, Brooklyn? What if he goes down yeah. uh, downtown Austin? What if, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the shift really came after I saw Ahmaud Aubrey's video. And I, I, I say this all the time. I never try to look at that stuff because some things I just don't want in my mind. I just want to sleep, you know, without thinking, oh my gosh, you know? And when I saw that video, it cut everything in my being. It cut my core as, because all I kept on thinking as a mother, this is my child, this is unacceptable. I, I have not looked at George Floyd. I cannot bring myself to look at George Floyd. I will not, I don't think I ever will, mm -hmm. but just hearing that. And I was just writing from a really, really angry place. And I'm saying, God, where are you? If you care so much, where are you? And I was really, really frustrated with the fact that my skin, because I have to see it in that general context, my skin, it makes people fearful that the minute you see or hear, you presume it's something negative. And I'm like, this can't be right. So I'm going off my faith. If you say I'm chosen and I'm royal, why is it that there is this consistent animosity against my skin? And I sat at my piano and I'm not a piano player. So don't judge me, ladies. I, shall, I cannot walk in your shoes. <laughs> uh -uh. Same I'm sitting at my, my, my keyboard and I'm just playing. And the words came to me as plain as ever. Mm -hmm. I'm enough. Simply, I was in tears. I have a video of it. I, just, I won't share it. I was just in tears. Because when I got I'm enough, it says, Varice, there's nothing you can do that's going to fix it right here now. Without me, you can't fix it. That's all I got for me. And I and I started singing. And it was it was probably of all the time I've been recording, it was the only time I'm like, I gotta get in the studio. I gotta get in the studio. And you know, a couple of things came up. I'm like, I gotta get in the studio. Like I thought, no, I've got to get the song recorded because it's not just speaking to my pain and my healing, it's gonna speak to somebody else's. And it was really a way to say, you know what? While there is this stigma happening. Let's change that. Let's change that. So even just from a, I don't want to say self perspective, but even in that context, I am enough. You are enough. And, and the same way that somebody else would want their, their children to thrive and live and just go downtown, mm -hmm. that should be okay for everybody else. You know, it shouldn't be that you know, I have to tell my son, be careful out there. Yeah. How long is too long? Waiting for hundred years, the pain, the hurt, the tears. You tell me you see nothing wrong. Enough is enough, is enough, is enough. Enough is enough, is enough, is enough. The cries from It's your truth, your healing. And I want to say to you, Marie, you are enough. And that song, like, it, it's it's embedded in me now. Like, I can feel it through my soul. Like, that's the power of music. Mm -hmm. And that's what you and Aisha bring, is this powerful moment for all that can connect us. And this is why we're having these discussions, because we are the human race. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that connect us all, you know, healing, pain, we all feel it. But through your music, it's just transcendent. So thank you. And you are enough. So I just love you for that. I'm giving you hugs. <laughs> you. I'll give you virtual hugs too. <laughs> Until one day. <laughs> oh, I love that. You know, I just want to touch on this. You know, after everything that happened, as a protest leader and somebody so heavily involved in activism, it seems like there was no space for me to breathe or to have that conversation. Or, you know, I had to just go, 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 go. Everybody's requesting all these things from me. And when that song played and when that song came up during, 
you know, previous to our candlelight vigil that we held, I remember being in such a dark place because I hadn't yet grieved, right? I was just building and building and building and building. And I'd been questioning so many things that were happening because yet, you know, six months has passed and we're still in the same place, you know, that frustration. And I remember hearing that song and feeling this wave of like release in a really healthy way, in a way that uh, was really able to connect, right? And and, and you, t- you were telling a story of something that wasn't just about the time of George Floyd, but of the time of Emmett Till, of the time of precursor of our ancestors, the time of our present, and the time of, unfortunately, hopefully the things that we can change, but what might happen again? Mm-hmm. And those fears that we sit with. and but it was in this way that allowed us to like still heal through music. And, and it was so power. Your music video was incredible. All of it, you both are just in, these incredible women to watch because I think even if you are an, artist, you, uh, an artist or a black woman who is an artist, you wanna see other ones who look like you. Okay. You don't wanna be that only representation. Okay. You want the others to thrive too. You wanna share them. It's not about competition, it's about lifting each other and mm-hmm. celebrating each other and and when we look at that and we kind of talk about creating our art and we talk about as black women especially the work that we have to do in our own communities do you think there's a cross for you and what we got to call artivism and do you feel that there's a way that your music i mean Varese, we spoke briefly about this but aisha maybe you want to start off has either been a way for you to heal or been a way for you to provide healing for others? Absolutely, absolutely. For myself uh, and, and hopefully for people who are listening. I think as, as artists, we are lucky um, that we have a medium of expression that is so that feels so universal, that, that, that can touch so many people. But as Black women in, in particular, um, especially during the turmoil and the uprisings of 2020, um, I truly, even in that dark time, I truly felt so lucky that I had a medium to express my anger because we know what it, what it feels like to be a Black woman and to have, hold anger. We're not allowed to hold anger. You know, if we do, it, it's, it's seen as, as aggressive, um, uh, uh, inactionable, you know? So, so writing from a place of anger felt like such a release uh, to, to express myself in that way so that I wasn't bottling these feelings up and holding it inside absolutely felt like a release. And I hope in doing so, I've given the space to other Black women as well. I've provided a space to other Black women as well to express um, emotion, whatever range it is. But I think anger in particular, because what we, what we have to deal with on a daily basis is anger inducing. And there is, and it is important for us to get that out. It's very important for us to get that out. I mean, we have all these talks about mental health, but one of the impediments for black women is that we carry such a burden on our shoulders and we're so, we're not allowed to express it because we are the fixers, we are the providers, we are the nurturers, we are the lovers, we are the saviors. So much so much of the time, we, it's our job to save literally the world. So, uh, you know, so I, I feel very, very privileged to be able to, to release some of that um, in music. And I hope that, um, uh, that the audience can fe- feel a release of some sort with that as well. Mm-hmm. I love that. And Maurice, you know, now that we are, you, you, you came out with I Am Enough. Do you see activism playing a part in your role in, as, as an artist moving forward? Absolutely. It's important for my children to know that we have to care about each other. And that means not everybody will look like them. Not everybody will actually even like them. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you don't stop caring. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you don't stop loving. Doesn't mean you don't stop uh, meeting the needs of others. And one of the things that impacted me last year, this time, um, we had a Black History event to do then, as opposed to Black Heritage. Thanks, Green, for the name update. 
And as I was researching some of the songs, why, you know, some of our ancestors did the songs that they did, you know, we sing them now as Negro spirituals, but the history behind it was that these people were literally singing through their pain. Mm -hmm. And as I thought about it, I thought about my First Nation brothers and sisters, my Indigenous brothers and sisters. And I thought, you know, me being new to Canada, I mean, I've been here since 2006, so that's still fairly new to Canada. But I'm going, wait a second, why is it since I've been here, the narratives are always negative. I've not heard, you know, and so I refuse to actually participate in those because I'm like, I don't know the history well enough for me to say intelligently, oh yeah, that's, that's true. And so I started researching and I'm going, and I was so bothered, so bothered by what I was hearing. And so I started telling my children, you don't take a story and run with it unless you've evaluated that story. And you change how people see others because I'm like, the same way they can, you know, create a story about you and then it's taken off with wings. I'm like, this is how that started. And we have to be the change. So the idea is the same plight that I have. And I'm so grateful that, you know, my friend Gerard, who's um, from a local music group that I'm affiliated with called the Flying Go Artists uh, of uh, indigenous uh, background was participating in the video. And when he did, can I tell you that we were in tears? It's almost like the song took on a whole different meaning. Mm -hmm. And so you're going, pain is pain is pain is pain. So we now have to take on the new mantra of how can we be the healers, mm -hmm. all of us. Mm -hmm. And so if I don't teach my children, then I'd be held responsible. Mm -hmm. So meeting the needs of others, I believe is, is essentially important. And I believe if I don't teach it to my children, you know, I, I can't hold on to the faith that somebody else is going to teach them outside of my home. So it starts with me. And, and I hope it, it overflows to somebody else. So in, not just in my home, but with my neighbors and with my community and with my city. And then it just overflows and overflows. And I believe the world can be a better place if we're all open to the idea of making the initial change. Exactly, exactly. And this is why we have these conversations so that we can empower people to do that in their homes with their children and just put impactful changes to the new generations out there so that they can carry this forward as well. Now, we know that there's different forms of artivism out there. And one of them I wanted to touch on was our very own Tracy Moore from City Line. You know, she's been hosting the show for a very long time and felt a need to kind of conform to, I guess, you know, the white privilege ways, you can say, having her hair straightened and all of that. But being a Black woman, your hair is your expression. That is part of your self-expression. That's where creativity comes in, and it is so beautiful. Now, I want to know, how, how has that impacted you and your artivism through your hair and your music and your creativity? And we can start with Aisha. Yeah, it's, this is my crown and glory to be, to be mm -hmm. truthful, you know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. I love it. Absolutely. And, and the, the pressure to conform to one idea, one Eurocentric centric idea of beauty is always all around you, especially in the business that we're in. It's already hard for women. It's doubly hard for Black women. Um, it, it is next to impossible for someone who embraces their you know, natural hair and their natural being. Um, but again, it's about this idea of representation, feeling a responsibility to the next generation coming up to showcase you know, who we are and that there's strength and beauty in the way that we look um, and in what we, and what we you know, have and we present. Um, so, it, it would never sit right with me to, to, and I've been there. I totally don't blame anyone for doing it. I have been there. I have straightened my hair. I have done the relaxers. I've done the weaves. I've done, done it all. But it just comes to, to me um, about wanting to be the image that I never got to see when I was younger really is what it just comes down to. And hoping that I can be an example in that sense. 
that you can be a musician, you can be an artist, you can be successful in however you naturally are. And it's just, it's really quite important. It's really, really quite important. Absolutely. And with this world reckoning, uh, going back to Tracy Moore, she finally felt the confidence in 2020 to let her hair be natural. Mm -hmm. And she was able to do that in the front of a magazine, you know, and that just, again, is just showing that being natural and being who you are, there is power in that and owning it. Like that just makes it more, you know, inspiring for young generations. And, you know, I see your beautiful hair, Queen and Reese, like, and I've seen Queen wear it in so many different ways. And I'm like, damn, I want to wear my hair like that, you know? And I'm sure there's other people that are watching and just so intrigued in this form of artivism, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I for so long just chemically straightened my hair, so long. And why, I always want to say because it made it easier for white people but really it made it easier for me because it was easier than being bullied. It was easier than feeling shamed. It was easier than feeling guilty than rather embracing. And again, like as you know, some of our viewers know, I come from a home that is all white. So what I see at home is very different than what I look like in the mirror. Um, but you know, it took me um, until like that documentary Good Hair to see this like new light of hair and start to like embrace it. And then I chemically straightened my hair and part of my head fell off and I was like, oh, never again <laughs> am I doing this. Mm -hmm. And you know, now it's kind of become this really, uh, like you kind of said, this form of art, I get to express in different ways, whether that's a wig, a weave, my natural, a braid, a, you know, there's just so many ways to like be creative with my hair. And, and, and I don't blame anyone. You know, Tracy Moore went through something that I went through as an artist, which was, being told my hair was not going to work for things or that you know it was too frizzy for ballet or it made people uncomfortable or like x y and z of the microaggressions and the racism that was just fed into me or that oh it's not professional mm. trump's on the tv every day with that haircut and nobody had no problem <laughs> you know what I'm saying? so like i think it was it's so obvious that their our hair can be our crown and our, mm -hmm. our glory and whether that's from shade nothing all the way to long beautiful locks I mean I should have been growing yours for as long as I can remember <laughs> and, and and that's something to honor so often our indigenous brothers and sisters talk about that and our Indian brothers and sisters talk about that but so rarely are we just like that's ours and, and maybe Baris you want to speak to that too on how you've embraced that in yourself, in your own home. I love your natural. It, it's one of those things where, I don't wanna say we major in the minors, but you're going, um, <laughs> I think oh, Indiari had this beautiful song. I am not my hair. I'm not, you know? And there's a stigma that sometimes what looks beautiful and, and, and that unfortunately was a trap for BIPOC women because the hair, the hair product market took off and you got everything to work on your hair, which didn't, which actually caused more damage. And we've always been trying to invent and reinvent. I mean, I have, you know, I have this amazing stylist who I love to bits. We will just go in and she'll just say, okay, let's try something different and we'll shave off the side. That was the look for a while. Growing up, that was never an option. Growing up, you're not thinking, let me get creative with my hair and everything being chemically based. And it's beautiful to see women of color now just embracing their beauty, their natural beauty and their hair. And you know, who's not rocking fro, rocking locks. And if it's not locks, it's braids. And if it's not braids, it's, it's shaved head. It's like, because really true beauty, true beauty is inside first. So you can have this fabulous hairdo and man, your character is mm, what's more important. And it's just beautiful to watch and see these young women coming up because I'm going, girls, you have this confidence that we did not have <laughs> back then. Say it again. <laughs> we were like, yeah, we were without, let's say we were without options. Mm. Now these sisters are making their own options mm -hmm. and it's beautiful to see. And I, and I celebrate every woman who's making it her objective 
to be her. Mm -hmm. I love that. Not to, it's not being limited to what anybody thinks. What's good for me right now? I love the community in our hair as well. You know, I, I like we all have a story of it falling out at some point or growing back or just the amount, the beautiful styles that we can do. And there's such a camaraderie between all of us with, with our stories in our hair. It's really beautiful. And I'm so glad and honored to have you on our show today. And I really want viewers to be able to connect with you. So maybe Aisha, you want to start off and then Baris, could you tell people how to get to know you, where to find you, where to watch you, where to hear you? all the good stuff because um this you're going to be adding them to your spotify like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i'd love to connect with all and all of the viewers so i'm on all social media platforms as life from the tribe um you can catch me on all of them i have a website as well if you want to speak to me personally you can send me a, a message i'm very personable so shoo away um but yeah life from the tribe on all social medias and life from the tribe on dot com to reach me. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> uh, again, just like Aisha, on all uh, social uh, media outlets, um, you can find my music, Reese Divine Music, uh, on YouTube in particular. Uh, and Reese Divine Music, if you do a search, you'll absolutely find me and engage with me in that capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea is not not only find for Reese, make sure you check out Aisha, make sure you check out the work that Queen is doing at Guelph for Black Heritage Society. And also, you know, continue to watch uh, Alicia because uh, bringing real stories, you know, this is real stories for all of us to hear and learn and grow from. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Supporting local Black community artists, this is where it begins, you know, and using this platform to share and showcase your experiences and perspectives. We are so grateful to all of you on the panel today. So thank you to Aisha, Varese, and Queen. We celebrate you. You are the epitome of Black excellence. And we want to thank you for your dedication, your resilience, and your tremendous work to making sure that, you know, things are more diverse and inclusive in our community and our country. And of course, we always love hearing from all of you out there and we always wanna connect with you. So you can connect with us on Instagram at Diverse and Converse, and you can head over to our show page on Rogers TV, Diverse and Converse, and catch up on all your favorite episodes, including this one here today. And remember, the goal is to connect, commit, and change. Thank you all for joining us here today. And we celebrate Black Heritage Month with all of you out there. So stay healthy and safe, everyone. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. It's the RTV Quiz. Giovanni Petiti hosts a weekly trivia competition that lets you play from the comfort of your couch. Play along at home and challenge your friends. And don't forget to follow along on social media. Let us know who's top of trivia and you can find yourself featured on a future episode. Are you kidding me, folks? It's the RTV Quiz, Wednesday nights at 7.30 p.m. on Rogers TV or at rogerstv.com slash RTV Quiz. on what's happening in your community. Your region this week, all local, all year round. Fridays at 7 p.m. right here